That's okay. Good evening. I think most of us are already here. So before I introduce to Kun um, Patricia Jolen Wilch, I hope I get the pronunciation right. Um, uh, there's a few other things um, that's on. In <coughs> so in two weeks, on the 16th of March, we have another lecture. Buddha as teacher of devas and humans, the question of omniscience by Dr. Frank Hoffman. By the way, I'm Tom Wittiaku, I'm the chair for uh, lecture committee and I'm a council member um, at the Sam Society. There's a few other um, um, things that are going to be on um, beside the lec lectures. We have study trips. Now, in March, 20 5th and 26th March, we have started gazing at Gangrejan, Pechaburi Pet province, with Mr. Vishnu Urshukiat. Then in April, um, 22nd to 30th of April, um, a visit to mysterious Sikkim and magical Darjeeling with Ruth Gerson. She's here. So if you want to see Sikkim, please sign up. Then another one, ah, this one coming up first in March. This one, I don't know that it's full yet or not, but please inquire with the staff. Nature and culture on the tropical sand dunes of the Andaman coast, 10 to 12 March, with Associate Professor Dr. Kitishet Sri Dit. Very interesting. I want to go myself, but I can't. Then, all the way to October, uh, a cultural trip to the Kingdom of Bhutan, 16 to 25th October this year, with the president herself, Kun Pilai Pan Sombatsiri. So if you're curious about these places, please sign up now. We are very honored again to have Kun Patricia Mujolan Welch to speak about Chinese zodiac sign. And today is on symbolism of the rabbit. In the past, she has talked about um, other signs, such as the rooster, the dog, and the pig. And then we have the pandemic. So we skip the rat, the tiger, the ox, and the tiger. So you have to come back in about 10 years to speak to all of that. I mean, because you have done all the presentation days already. Now, before we skip, hop, and jump, to the rabbit. Um, Kun Patricia um, also worked as an academic and with private sector, and she has written a few books, especially the one on Chinese art, A Guide to Motives and Visual Imagery. Now, rabbit is one of the, they said it's considered one of the luckiest signs of all zodiac signs. I'm not sure about that. But King Rwanda the Ninth was born on the year of the rabbit. So if you see some temples with rabbits, that doesn't have anything to do with Buddhism. Usually it's built or have some symbol in honor of King Rana, Rama the Ninth or King Pumi Pun. Now, according to Hun Patricia, these signs dated long way back before China became the kingdom, the Middle Kingdom. And all these animal symbols have a long history. So do they, do, do these, you know, relate to um, Easter bunnies, for example? You'll find out. So I'll give the floor to Kun Patricia Welch. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you very much. It is really a pleasure to be here again. Uh, my husband and I lived in Bangkok. It was one of our happiest periods together. Uh, we have a condo. We come back occasionally over the last 25 years, I guess it's been. It's just so nice to be back. And this is one of my favorite talks. I give it every year um, for different museum groups, talking about the animal of the year. And it's really a pleasure to be here again. So although this talk has been um, inspired by the upcoming Chinese year of the rabbit, um, when I originally began doing it, I discovered that the symbolism of rabbits um, 
it doesn't begin in China. It's much older. And starting just to talk about the Chinese year of the rabbit would be like starting a book halfway through. So we're going to start at the very, very beginning and pick up the China thread when appropriate, which will be in about 2,000 years. So we'll start at the beginning. Egyptologists tell us that images of desert hair began to appear in Egypt right around 3000 BC. And in another 500 years or so, they began to appear on amulets, which their wearers wore, believing that it would grant them long life and powers of rapid regeneration, and help them find their eternal spirit when they emerged into their new life in the afterlife or upon their death. Now, most of the examples we have have been found in Egyptian tombs, and they date back to right around the 11th century BC. I don't think I need to explain to you why rabbits are associated as symbols of rapid regeneration. We all know that one of their best traits is rapid regeneration. And I didn't know until I did this research that their gestation period is only 30 to 32 days. And smaller rabbits um, may only have four or five kits, but larger rabbits can have up to 12. About 60 kilometers north of the city of Luxor in Egypt is the Temple of Dendara. And you have one lucky member of this audience who's actually visited it. It was built around 2000 BC. It's immense. It houses a basilica, two birth houses, a sacred lake, and numerous other temples and structures around it. Inside on the temple walls, and you see a portion of them here, there's a hair-headed god and goddess. Now, unfortunately, none of the pictures I could find actually showed that part of the wall, and I haven't been there myself yet. The goddess is believed to be Nut or Unut. Um, ancient Egyptian only wrote uh, consonants, no vowels, so we have to sort of guess what the, what the vowels were, but we think it was probably Nut. She is the goddess of the heavens, while the god was most likely a representation of Osiris, a god of fertility and rebirth who was sacrificed to the Nile every year in the form of a hare. In addition, the creator god, Ra, was also worshipped in an animal form as a hare in a nearby temple near the city of Hermopolis. So there seems to be a considerable amount of confusion over the Egyptian gods in who was in charge of what, when, because it kept changing. Their roles changed, the identities changed. The one thing that didn't change was their identification with specific animals. So we're going to keep it very simple, and we're going to simply say that the early recognition of the hare begins here, ancient Egypt, with the gods and with Nut, the goddess of the sky. Now, the John Hopkins Archaeological Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, informs us that the Cape Hare may have derived its amuletic significance from its hieroglyphic meaning because the picture of a crouching hare was used to symbolize the word or the sound when. We think it had an a ah sound, the W-N anyway, which most frequently is used in hieroglyphics as a verb meaning to be or is. But I think it makes more sense to me because I did start studying, and I did study two years of ancient um, hieroglyphics, that the meaning was probably derived from the symbol, but we'll go with what the Archaeological Museum of Baltimore says. But the next time you see an archaeological text with a crouching hare, you should know that the translation of that particular sign is to be or is or was. Here you see the goddess Nut. Now she is straight-armed, straight-legged, and she's forming three sides of a square because she's representing the sky, she's embracing it. And every evening she swallows the sun, which then passes through her body until she gives birth to it the next day at dawn. On the wall you can see a parade of the gods, and they're all wearing headdresses with the various animals they're associated with. So we find a very important beginning element of the symbolism of the rabbit right here in ancient Egypt around the themes of the sun, the moon, gods and goddesses associated with hares, fertility, birth, reincarnation. But some archaeologists believe that even these beliefs may have been influenced by other older influences. During Napoleon's Egyptian campaign in 1788 to 1801, 
French scientists discovered the zodiac in the ceiling of a small chapel dedicated to Osiris atop the Hathor temple just outside the city of Dandara. It most likely dates back to the Greco-Roman period around the first century BC uh, based on the fact that in one of the cartouches they actually found a Greek word that means uh, autocrator. Most scholars are fairly confident that the zodiac was inspired and brought, uh, abroad and brought to Egypt during the Ptolemaic or the Roman period. The diagram clearly shows that the ancient Egyptians set their own zodiac of 12 signs, which they named after their own gods and goddesses, each of which, as you've already heard, was already associated with an animal. And the complexity of this amazing relief depicting the solar system divided into the realms, controlled by different gods, is, is quite, it's, it's absolutely quite amazing. I don't know if you noticed, I saw some people spearing. Do you see Nut that she's swallowing the sun? That's the round ball in front of her mouth. Just in case you missed that, I wanted to go back. I saw a quizzed, quizzling look on someone's face. The ancient Egyptian calendar was a solar calendar consisting of 365 days divided into three seasons of 120 days each. And to make up the remaining five days, the ancient Egyptians added an extra five-day period, which was treated as outside of the year. And furthermore, each season consisted of four months, with each month split into three ten-day periods. Now, those of you who know the Chinese calendar will see how similar this is. You can immediately recognize the similarities between the two based on the solar system, months of 30 days, weeks of 10 days, with the need to add extra days every so often to keep the calendar consistent over time. And this is why the date of Chinese New Year varies each year from um, one day to another, but it's always in that range between January 21st and February 20. As a result, some historians believe that many of the Chinese patterns related to the idea of a calendar and zodiac came from the Greco-Roman world through Hellenized Egypt, most likely entering China via Bactria around the beginning of the Christian era. If so, it's not surprising that our earliest known references to the Chinese zodiac in China are found at exactly this same time, during the Han Dynasty, the Western Han, so from about 200 BC on for 200 years. But then they were localized to their own geography. Drawing or representations of animals is one of the oldest forms of art expressions which over time acquired symbolic meanings peculiar to a time and place, religion and culture. But as contact between cultures occurs, both the animals and their meanings sometimes change to represent other more familiar indigenous animals, which could then have different interpretations. Egyptologists have long known how a prominent deity and its associated animal in one location may play a very minor role in another location due to the differences in terrain or climate or history. For example, we find crocodile deities and powers in both Egypt and India, but obviously not in China. Although we do find a component of the crocodile in the famous Makara of Southeast Asia. So this formation and spread and transmigration of symbols and motifs is actually quite fascinating to spend some time studying. Now there's a black hole surrounding how the 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac were finally set. But we do have several popular children's stories telling us how the animals were arranged and which order they come in. And the best known relates a tale of how the Jade Emperor has arranged a um, a race across a river to determine which animals shall come first in sequence. And the story goes that the crafty rat jumps on the back of the strongest swimmer, which is the ox, who not very, being very bright agreed to this plan. But the rat jumped off ahead, so the rat comes in first and the ox comes in second in sequence. The tiger, being the strongest and very fast, comes in third. 
but the rabbit comes in fourth. And that's because the rabbit is so clever and can't swim, it decides very quickly it's going to have to jump from rock to rock and then to a floating log and boom, he comes in fourth. And this is a foreshadowing of something we're going to see later, one of the most important characteristics associated with rabbits in folk tales. And that's how I'm going to end today's talk. It's the idea of brains over brawn. And we'll come to that later. So now we're going to turn to Chinese archaeology to find our first rabbit clue in China. This is a very famous painted funerary scroll, not really a scroll, it's more of a banner. And it was found at the Ma Wang Dui tombs in Changsha, China. It dates to about 168 BC. And it was draped over the coffin of an aristocratic lady whom we know today as Lady Dai. It employs both Confucian and Taoist concepts as it portrays the path that she's going to take at her death now that she's left the world of the living. So it begins in the underworld at that central tableau we see at the bottom of the banner where she's slouching with her cane, which by the way, when they opened her coffin was found buried with her in her coffin. I think that's quite charming. And then next we see the two dragon bodies that are knotted together through a jade ring. That's known as a bee. And as we move up, we see the feasting scene where her funeral feast is set with all of the goodies and the appropriate Confucian ritual vessels. And as we continue upward, we see Lady Dai continuing on her path from death up into her next existence, still holding her cane and with her attendants following behind. At the very top of this um, cloth, <clears throat> we see now that we're in the Taoist-inspired paradise, presided over by the Queen Mother of the West, known as Shi Wang Mu. And it's the peaches, it's said, from her garden, which according to many, grant immortality. Now she's top center, she has a human body, but she has a dragon tail, and she's flanked by five cranes, which are auspicious birds in Chinese thought. In mortuary art, she's a benevolent matriarch who welcomes the souls of the dead into her heavenly paradise above a mountaintop. And beneath her are two riders on horseback, and they're pulling on a tasseled bell. And if you look carefully, you'll see at the top of it, there's a cup, and that holds the broth of immortality. Now we're going to take a closer look at this cloth at the very top. If you look on the top right, you see a round red image of the sun, and it has a bird in it. There's a dragon, and there are ten suns. So each red circle represents a sun, and the story of which I'll tell you in a minute. And on the left is a crescent moon, and it's inhabited by a frog or toad above which you can just see, look really carefully, the head of a white jade rabbit. It's by the purple arrow. And I'll show you a drawing on another slide <clears throat> where it's far more visible. Seated below that crescent moon is Chang Er, the lady who is said to live or reside in the moon. This mural was found in a tomb approximately 200 years later during the Eastern Han Dynasty. So now we're 25 to about 200 CE. And here we can see elements of the rabbit motif in a stone frieze. The seated female figure facing us is Shi Wang Mu, the Queen Mother of the West. And we know this from textual references that describe her strange hair or hairdo or what, crown, whatever she's got on top of her head. And she's surmounted by kneeling figures that are offering um, gifts. The rabbits and toads to her left are preparing some sort of concoction. The rabbits are busy with a mortar and pestle, while the others are carrying cooking implements. And you also see an approaching fox, because according to legend, she was accompanied by a nine-tailed fox, or at least nine foxtails, were said to always be visible trailing out from underneath her skirts. Now note <clears throat> on the far left in the disc, which represents a full moon, there's a running hare or rabbit and a toad or a frog. Here's a close-up of that scene from the famous mural, which is displayed in a museum in Xi'an. 
Why, you might wonder, is there a toad? This is most likely the evolution of ancient Egypt's frog goddess, whose name was Hecate. She was believed to have powers of generation and fertility and assisted women in childbirth. And since moons are associated with women, I suspect the frog was sort of just a hanger-on of the ensemble during its transmission from Egypt into China. But with the path crossing over the dry plains of Central Asia, that Egyptian frog becomes a Chinese toad by taking on the characteristics of the new environment. However, I have found such Egyptologists as Henry Frankfurt, who describes the Egyptian goddess as a toad. So that's why I said toad slash frog. I'm quite sure with the Nile River, it's a frog. When it comes to China, it turns into a toad. And as I said, just sort of came along for the ride with all the transmission of the others. But let's look at our main topic and talk about, are these rabbits that we're looking at, or are these hares? Now, unless you grew up in the country or by a forest, you probably don't know the difference between a hare and a rabbit. How many of you? You didn't look at this, actually. Okay, more than the usual. There are four of you out here. And from looking at how they're represented in art, I don't think most artists knew the difference either. But anyway, we're going to use the term interchangeably in this talk, since the same Chinese word means both hare or rabbit um, in Chinese, tutsa. But once you're aware of the difference, you'll always be able to identify which is which. And now you know that the early Egyptians depicted hares, as these were native to the Egyptian landscape, whereas China more typically has rabbits. So what are the differences? I've outlined them for you on the slide, and I hope you'll take a look. You'll notice that the hares are much bigger, their ears are longer, they go back, they have very strong hind legs because they run very fast, whereas the rabbits are smaller, they live underground, hares live above the ground, etc., etc. The connection of rabbits or hares with the moon, <coughs> excuse me, which is the ultimate yin symbol, I'm sure you're all aware of yang and yin, and the sun being the ultimate yang symbol, is found in Chinese folk tales, where they're linked to the goddess of the moon, Chang'er, whom we get a peek of back in this Ma Wang Dui funeral banner seated just below the crescent moon on that large undulating dragon with the snake-like tongues. And in that upper left-hand corner above the toad slash hair is a little white rabbit can you see it in this drawing now? Yeah. Usually referred to as a jade rabbit. You need to look really carefully, as only the head and a little bit of the upper body are still visible. And sorry, there just are no good pictures of this particular detail. Chang Er's story is also very old and dates back to the Warring States period in a divination book known as the Storehouse of All Things. And her backstory combines several elements of popular Chinese and fairy tales. So once upon a time, when the world was threatened by having too many sons and was in danger of burning up, a brave archer by the name of Ho Yi shot down all but one son, saving the world from burning up. And out of gratitude, he was given an elixir of immortality by this queen mother of the West, Shi Wang Mu. But he was unfortunately married to the wrong woman because he was married to Chang Er, who wanted this elixir for herself. So she stole it, quickly consumed it, and fled to the moon, where she has resided ever since, with her rabbits. Now, whether the rabbits were there originally or whether she brought them with her, we have absolutely no idea. It's left un unmentioned. And whether the elixir of immortality was made from the peaches that were said to have grown in Shi Wang Mu's garden, or it was made of something else, is also unclear in all the folk tales. It's more likely not peaches that are being ground up into this elixir of immortality, but something else, as I'm soon going to show you. Amongst the, er <coughs> excuse me, I don't know why my voice has gone. Let me just have another drink of water. Can I talk while I'm sucking one of those? Yes. Uh, we'll try. Uh, oh, I 
don't know if that'll work. <clears throat> okay. Hmm. Amongst the earliest depictions of Chinese zodiac animals are tomb figurines, which either portray actual animals or more often, perhaps inspired by the ancient Egyptian figures of gods and goddesses with animal heads, were portrayed as human or possibly godlike figures, but with animal heads. And this is something very interesting to think about. Too much of a similarity there to be accidental. It was also very, very common practice to portray them as a group of officials with each holding one zodiac animal, as you can see on the right, or sometimes just wearing a hat with the zodiac animal as the hat shape itself. This pair of rabbits belonged to a group of five that were found in one single Han tomb, so that's 200 BC to 200 AD. And their workmanship shows that they were highly regarded but because there were originally five, we know that they weren't part of a zodiac set. A set has one each of an animal, and that's it. Now, one often finds rows of animal figurines in Chinese tombs, pigs, fowls, sheep, and the like. But such groups represent the tomb occupants' future meals. These are not zodiac representations. So we don't know why there was a group of five rabbits. It seems very strange, and archaeologists have no answer. Perhaps the tomb's occupant was a young person who liked rabbits or kept rabbits as pets. We don't know. But the care with which this set was made sets it apart, and we would love to know the significance of it. For the next thousand years, from the end of the Han until the Ming Dynasty, there is a total dearth of rabbit motifs in China or at least as far as archaeologists and art historians can find during the exact years that we believe they must have entered Chinese thought from the Mediterranean or that part of the world. During the first millennium, they would have come in along the Silk Road. But where are the rabbits? Had they been eclipsed completely except when they ended up in a cooking pot? I searched and have searched and have searched, and I found nothing for almost a year. And then three months ago, I tuned into a lecture from the Dunhuang Institute along the Silk Road. It was a lecture given by a professor of Chinese at Cambridge University, Dr. Imre Galambos. Based on his research into ancient Chinese manuscripts he had found along the Silk Road. And it was interesting, but it didn't really catch my attention until this slide popped up. It's a page from a manuscript found by Ariel Stein. It's now in the British Museum. It's known as Stein Painting Number 209. Dates to the end of the first millennium. Bingo on the timing. He suggested it might be a crudely drawn figure of a child worshiping a Buddha. But I knew we were looking at a rabbit here. Even before, and this is absolutely, I, I jumped out of my chair. Even before he told us the name of this particular, particular text, and it's the Fo Shuo Shu Ming Jing, which translated means the sutra spoken by the Buddha on prolonging life. Come on. We've been exchanging emails ever since. I think I blew him away with this, and he's really had trouble struggling with this. Neither of us really have enough supporting evidence, but I'm pretty sure that I'm right. This is a rabbit. And I think it goes back to the story of when the Buddha was wandering through the forest and was hungry, and the animals of the forest came and brought him food as, as offerings. But the poor rabbit could find nothing, so it offered itself to the Buddha as a sacrifice. So, uh, believe what you like. I know what I believe. Most art of this period consists of religious paintings of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, scenic landscapes, scenes of the upper classes and their activities. Why was the subject matter of artists so limited during these years? And it's possibly because most of our examples come from tombs. So by definition, they were limited to scenes that were of material or symbolic value to the occupants of those tombs. So they related to the afterlife, provisions for it, weapons, precious metals, clothing, food, ceramics, and the like. So I think that's why for this thousand year period, it, there's really nothing. But then everything changes. At the end of the Yuan dynasty, 
1368 with the establishment of the Ming. And to say that rabbits came into their own during the Ming is it, a complete understatement. Suddenly they were everywhere. They're a popular motif. They're found on court concubines' hairpins. They're decorating Ming shards found in Fustat. Um, that shard is now in the um, British Museum. You find them on screens, on textiles, on ceramics. You find them all over the place. Why, at the end of the Yuan Dynasty, after a thousand years of no rabbits, do we suddenly find rabbits? Most likely, it was the birth of popular literature. Folk tales and stories came into their own. The Yuan Dynasty was a foreign dynasty. It was ruled by Mongols. We sometimes call it the Mongolian Dynasty. And when that dynasty was um, prevalent, the literati were basically bereft of jobs. They lost their jobs. They stopped the examinations. You had all these learned men. What did they do? They went off. They wrote poetry. They, this is the blossoming of theater in Chinese history. And a lot of them began, began recording the folk and fairy tales. And they began recording them in vernacular Chinese. So this was the birth of popular literature. And with popular literature came lots of myths and stories about fairies who lived in the moon with rabbits, queen mothers of the west, etc., etc. So suddenly, during the Ming, we have this appearance. This birth of popular literature gives birth also to the growth and the appearance of rabbits in Chinese art. And there's something else that we're noting about the depictions of rabbits during this period. And do note these are rabbits, they are not hares. Take a good look at this Ming Dynasty festival badge. Note that these rabbits are very carefully positioned around plants, green plants. It's a core ingredient of medicinal potions, these green plants, telling us now that their association with the collection and the pounding of herbs, the making of elixirs, has now become a very important integral part of their identity. And where does this come from? that old folk tale of Hoi and his wife now being collected and circulated along with stories about all the other folk heroes in Chinese tales, Guandi, Miaoshan, and others. Rabbits amidst plants becomes an especially popular theme on the new blue and white ceramics that China starts exporting to the world en masse from the Ming Dynasty on. There's an expression, Ming Dynasty blue and white. There's a reason for that expression. Once the trade restrictions were removed, you had this outpouring of blue and white ceramics going to um, foreign and export markets. And I've chosen for you three of my favorites. On the left, you see a small white rabbit. It's hiding amongst plants behind a rock, and that's on a Wanli era um, croc charger. Croc is just the name given to this uh, early blue and white export Chinese porcelain named after the Portuguese ships, the Carex, that carried it back to Europe. Top center is a smaller dish from the same period with a white rabbit surrounded by an assortment of plants staring up at the moon. And on the far right is this very strange cartoon drawing of a rabbit. This is one of my favorites. When I asked the British Museum curators <clears throat> What was that other figure on the saucer with an absolutely straight face? He said, why, it's a wolf. Oh, uh, OK. <clears throat> During this period, you even find rabbits on the sutra covers made for Buddhist manuscripts. Now, these examples were made from court textiles, most likely worn by women, as only eunuchs and women would have worn a garment featuring rabbits. And in the case of the example on the top, it was from an empress's robe. So here's a positive identification of the appearance of rabbits on Buddhist artifacts. So take that, Cambridge professor. <laughs> Although this was not the original purpose, obviously, of these textiles. Now, if you're wondering why there are crabs amidst the design in the bottom example, it's because of a homophone in Chinese that makes the spoken word for crab, xie, rhyme with a word that means harmony, xie. They just have different tones. One's a rising tone, the other's falling tone. But harmony is a, a very key Buddhist concept and very appropriate, therefore, in the sutra cover. So like the rabbits and the crabs, crabs also have fertility symbolism because they have lots of eggs. So perhaps due to the amount of eggs they produce, which is why um, the, the homophones sort of fit together, somebody thought it was an apt symbolism to put on this uh, sutra cover. 
Their new popularity on textiles is explained by one of the great Sinologists who has worked all of his life in Chinese textiles and symbology. He's no longer with us, Shiloh Kamen. He wrote that it's always been the custom in the Chinese court on special occasions to add relevant emblems of a particular occasion to their regular insignia or to the background of their dragon robes or even as a principal decoration on an outer robe. So this textile is just such an example. It's a festival badge. It's, it's not a square, Mandarin squares, because those are rank badges. But festival badges are not square. If you notice, they're, they're sort of trapezoidal in shape. And that helps us differentiate them. And they show traditional Chinese designs that fit with the holiday. Their motifs are very calendar specific. This one would have been used at the time of the Moon Festival, which was traditionally on the eighth day of the eighth lunar month, when people ate moon cakes and climbed hills in the evening to admire the moon. We have to remember that the Mongol rulers of the previous dynasty, the Yuan, had been aliens in China. They did not celebrate the old Chinese holidays according to traditional Chinese customs. And during that period of foreign occupation, the native Chinese had to observe their holidays and celebrations in the privacy of their own homes. So when the Yuan dynasty ended, there was this incredible outflowing of the traditional Chinese designs and festivities and practices. And it was really a very, it, it had patriotic overtones. So the old holidays, the old festivities were revived. These were popular outbursts of Chinese-ness. And we can attribute the popularity of rabbits during this period to correlate along with the growth of popular literature and the return to native Chinese rule. But all things come to an end. And when the Ming Dynasty ends, it falls to the foreign Manchus in 1644. The Chinese festivities are replaced now by Manchu festivities and holidays and practices. And the practice of these Chinese court costumes and these special um, festive badges disappears. So these festival badges were made and worn only during the Ming Dynasty. Maybe you wore them later in the Qing Dynasty, but you wouldn't have left your house. They're extremely, extremely rare. So we're very lucky that we have the few examples left to us that we have. Here's the second one. This one shows just a large rabbit surrounded by green plants, looking over his shoulder again at the moon. And this third badge is very unusual. It features a white rabbit under a dragon. So normally you would associate that with the emperor. But look very carefully at the bottom of this particular um, decorative badge. And you see two small phoenixes. That tells us immediately it was worn by an empress, not an emperor. Even though it's got a dragon on the top. But perhaps the most famous rabbit of the Qing dynasty is that which disappeared from the famous fountain, which featured the 12 zodiac animals from the Beijing Summer Palace in 1799 during the reign of the Emperor Kangxi. That was looted in 1860 during the Second Opium War by European troops. When two of the long lost stolen heads were put up for sale in Paris in 2009, the world was shocked and delighted it was the head of the rat and the rabbit, and all chaos erupted. China demanded them back as part of their cultural heritage. The heads had belonged to fashion designer Yves Saint Laurent, <clears throat> and they were quickly withdrawn from the sale. And you can see the original rabbit head in the upper left as it appeared in the Christie's catalog. I know many of you here, we've, we've spoken about this. On the bottom left are Ai Weiwei's 2010 copies of the heads, which he named the Circle of Animals. He made them a year after the Christie's sale because he was incensed at the uproar that the Chinese were making. He wrote in his autobiography, I smelled hypocrisy in the indignation. He said, until the 1990s, peasants were carting off marble from this palace to build pig pens, and now suddenly it's part of their cultural heritage. Hence his decision to make a new complete set on a larger scale than the originals. But critics noted that the project complicated discussions of repatriation, shared cultural heritage, and contemporary understandings of art. This sounds like some of my colleagues I work with. 
But Ai Weiwei wasn't able to attend the ceremony, which was the inaugural showing of these heads in New York City, because by then he'd been abducted by the Chinese government and was being held in a secret prison. And so the association of rabbits with the moon and longevity, especially for the Taoists, whose philosophy was based on the search for longevity and hopefully immortality, continued even after the moon festival had lost most of, most of its importance and festival badges were no longer worn in China. As we see in these ceramic figures of a rabbit, one clutching the stem of a magic mushroom believed to grant immortality, a lingzhi, the Japanese followed with a similar fascination with rabbits and also associated them with the moon and longevity, as you see in the okimono on the right. And rabbits were a favorite subject for artists producing decorative uh, displays. But now we've gotten a little too far ahead of our story. We got diverted by East Asia when our story in West and Central Asia and even Europe is far from complete. So we're gonna go back now in time. <clears throat> The popularity of hares did not die in Egypt with the pharaohs. Scholars tell us that the subject of both hares and rabbits was very popular in the late Egyptian Islamic era, especially in the Fatimid period. They were depicted in ivory or wood, they were carved on window panels, they were in miniature paintings, textiles, and ceramics, and especially during that 10th to 13th century period. Here you see a bronze figurine of a hare dated to the 11th century from Fatimid Egypt and two beautiful luster painted bowls both showing a hare and look very carefully you must when you see an animal with anything else I tell you it's what that other thing is that's the most important clue a grape leaf Notice that these hares unlike earlier Egyptian depictions now show them carrying a plant specifically grape leaves these are not accidental scenes. They must have additional meaning, most likely underscoring the animal's association, in this case, with medicinal plants and herbs. And although archaeologists have found architectural details of rabbits eating grapes in lots of locations across Central Asia, we cannot confidently say we understand the full meaning of these. But we do know that the association of medicinal plants or herbs wasn't restricted to rabbits, but includes deer as well. And this was true, or is true, also of China. When we encounter Chinese patterns of deer feeding and look closely, you're apt to find a lingzhi or a magic mushroom associated with longevity. They're not just munching on grass out there. In other words, there's always a deeper meaning when we encounter two things in association with each other that repeat. But for today, let's just return to our, let's forget the deer and return to rabbits. During the 10th to 12th century, Egypt was ruled by the Fatimids. They were Shia Muslims who believed that the true Imams, or the true spiritual leaders of Islam, were the descendants of the Prophet based upon his daughter, Fatima, and his kinsman, Ali. So simplifying without going into too much Islamic history and theology, one of the communities within Shia Islam is a school known as the Twelvers. And they acquired their name because they believe in 12 divinely ordained leaders, known as the 12 Imams. Rabbits were sacred to the Twelvers because they believe that rabbits accompanied the 12th absent imam. And he's believed to have been already born, but is concealed and will re-emerge and bring justice and peace in the world at the end of time. Why rabbits? Maybe because they live in the present, but hold the promise of the ever after? Your guess is as good as mine. But by the 11th and 12th century, the Twelver Shiite doctrine had become the dominant sect in Egypt, and rabbits eating grape leaves in a peaceful setting was seen as an expression of optimism and good luck. Trade and increased contact between East and West meant that the 16th and 17th centuries, you find lots of hares and rabbits clutching or eating a plant, and this has become a very popular ceramic motif. You find it even on Portuguese faience and on tin glazed earthenware. 
when I was in Lisbon in November, I went into this one big historical museum and I said, do you have any, uh, any uh, pictures of um, rabbits eating plants? And the lady behind the um, information desk literally rolled her eyes and said, second floor, turn left. And uh, I found whole cases, seriously, like about 40 of them all gathered together. And that's what a popular motif they were. But the motif of rabbits gathering or carrying or shown amidst grapevines proves to be even older than Fatimid Iran when I did a little research. And now I'm going to show you an exquisite Christian example dating back to the 6th century, 500 years before the Fatimid period of Iran. This is the throne of Maximus. It was made for Archbishop Maximus of Ravenna who uh, ruled from 540 to 547. He was a protege of Justinian I. It was carved in the Byzantine Empire in Alexandria or Constantinople, we don't know where, and shipped to Ravenna. And the style is a mixture of early Christian and Byzantine. It's made of carved ivory panels with frames of winding vines and grapevines in relief. And within the grapevines are assorted animals, including several hare and it's by no means unique. The combination of animals within vines has been described by one scholar as the most vulgar artistic idiom of pre-Islamic art. And it's believed to have been a clear reference to a future life and paradise. But by the 12th century, it completely disappears. And this is because that's the period when the Islamic world began to turn against pictorial symbolism and replaced it with the writing of verses from the Quran instead. Now, when you think of Christian symbols, your thoughts probably run to a manger scene, the piata, fish, a crucifix, perhaps the Cairo, one of the earliest forms of, of a Christogram, where the two Greek letters form together the name Christ. A rabbit wouldn't be the first symbol that pops into your mind? No, I don't think so. So how should we interpret this carving of three hairs in Germany's 13th century Paderborn Cathedral? Three hares or rabbits are shown chasing each other in a circle, their bodies positioned in a rotational symmetry so that if you look carefully, each of their ears is shared by two hares. So there's really only three ears in that entire depiction. This symbol is not explained by any text of the day and it does appear elsewhere as well and is thought to have a whole range of symbolic or mystical associations ranging from fertility to a lunar cycle. But when used in Christian churches, it's presumed to be a symbol of the Trinity and perhaps even of the resurrection to come of Christ. And what of Easter with its rabbits and eggs? An eighth century document written by a monk tells us that Östermonath has a name which is now translated Pascal, once called after a goddess whose Anglo-Saxon name was Östra, in whose honor feasts were celebrated and she is often pictured with a hare at her feet, as her symbols were the hare and an egg. The problem is that she, in turn, has probably been inspired by an even earlier goddess, Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of fertility, which has led many scholars just to throw up their hands and declare, okay, it's a female, unknown, comes by many names. But the rabbit and the eggs remain in common, and we're told that she was simply intellectually abducted by Justinian the Great, the Eastern Roman emperor of the sixth century, and rebranded Christian. At this point, we can round the circle. Rabbits were clearly not just decorative, but held meaning in the pre-Christian world that surfaces again in Christian art. What that meaning is, scholars are very reluctant to define other than to agree that rabbits clearly have connotations with the moon, with its lunar cycles, which are tied with feminine cycles of fertility, birth, reincarnation, rejuvenation, and hence their association with the Christian holiday of Easter, as well as being very ideally suited for a Chinese audience that has many years of complex ideas concerning death, the afterlife, and longevity potions. Here is Titian's rendering from 1530 entitled The Madonna of the Rabbit. It's in the Louvre. Has anyone actually seen it? Beautiful painting. Here the rabbit is clearly a symbol of fertility due to its whiteness, but it's also symbolic testimony to Mary's purity 
and according to experts, the mystery of the reincarnation. And now we can circle back to Asia, because we would be very remiss if we didn't talk in this Chinese year of the rabbit for at least a few minutes about the special role that rabbits play in Asian and Southeast Asian folktales. Like the Chinese, the Japanese consider the autumn full moon to be the most beautiful. And the tradition of celebrating the harvest moon came to Japan from China during the Heian period, so 8th to 12th century, which was a time known for the aristocratic's dedication to aesthetics and poetry. The Japanese autumn festival is based upon the Buddhist story of when the Buddha, when traveling on earth, became hungry and the animals of the world sacrificed themselves, blah, blah, blah. I've already told you that story. The grateful Buddha offers the hare immortality and settles him on the moon in the Japanese story. And at this point, the stories merge because both Chinese and Japanese believe when you look at the moon, you can see the hare's silhouette grinding a medicine of immortality with a mortar and a pestle. Japan, however, has two lovely ladies associated with the moon, both the traditional moon goddess, Chang'er, as well as one of Japan's oldest romances, the fairy tale of the moon princess. So once upon a time, a bamboo cutter found a miniature girl inside a glowing bamboo shoot, and believing her to be divine, he and his wife decide to raise her. She grows up, of course, to be a true beauty, but she tries to avoid marriage, so she sets an impossible task that, of course, everyone fails. But when the emperor comes to woo her, she has to confess what the problem is. She has to confess she's originally from the moon, but she disobeyed her mother and was being punished by serving some years on earth. But now she would have to return home. So on the night of the full moon, a procession of celestial beings led by the Buddha was said to descend from the moon and gave her a robe that would erase her memories of her life on earth. They also gave her a cup, which she handed to the bamboo cutter, and that cup held the elixir of life. He, in turn, presented it to the emperor, who threw it into Mount Fuji, and since then, the mountain has always smoked. In another version, her sisters come and rescue her and take her back to the moon with them. In the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, we have a beautiful set of these kosometsuke dishes, which were made in Jingdezhen for export to the Japanese market, and rabbits was one of the most popular motifs that could be used. Those of you who buy Japanese um, utensils may have wondered why they're always in sets of five. And that's because five was the maximum number of people who were allowed to attend a traditional tea ceremony at one point in Chinese his and Japanese history. Natsukis appeared in Japan in the 17th century. These are these small carved toggles that secure the cord holding a little pouch onto a robe sash. And rabbits, because of their association with longevity and cleverness, became very, very popular Natsukis. You may have even read a very delightful book called The Hare with Amber Eyes, which tells the story of a famous potter's search for his family history through an inherited Natsuki collection that featured a hare with amber eyes. It was a lovely book. Now, I mentioned earlier that folktales around the world often portray the rabbit as a small but very clever animal. And the Japanese also attribute this character trait of cleverness to rabbits. And they have a large number of clever rabbit stories, including this one. This is called the white hair of Inaba. A rabbit wants to cross the ocean to reach the island of Inaba. Hmm, how shall I do that? It's very big. So it makes friends with a shark. Now, why the hell would it choose a shark? But OK, it chooses a shark. There's another variation of the story where it's a crocodile but it's very clever. Oh my gosh, aren't you handsome? Oh, and so big. You must be really unique. Oh no, you aren't unique. You have brothers like this. Oh, I don't believe that. Oh, you'll get them? Oh, that would be really nice. Could you line them up so I can count them? So of course the shark or the crocodile does that. The rabbit races across and reaches the other side. The moral of the story, according to the Japanese, is not to trick people to get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> but stories in which a land animal deceives an aquatic creature to cross a body of water, um, a river in most cases, are found throughout Southeast Asia and in India as well. 
This story is very well known, and if you spot this woodblock print by Katsushika Kaksai, now you know the story behind it. You see the crocodiles lining up by the river. The very nature of rabbits makes them obviously very popular figures, whether it's Burmese opium weights, a traditional Thai coconut scraper, a, a burry rum lime pot with a little hole on the top. Um, we find them everywhere. The third of these Tibetan Buddhist prayers are amulet holders showing the bird, the rabbit, the monkey, and the elephant standing in each other's backs has two meanings. When you see it as a mural in the temple, it's supposed to signal that age confers seniority in the monastic community. But as visitors to a temple and when we take our children, we tell them that the moral of this particular grouping is how by working together as four friends, you can achieve any goal you want, because now they can reach the highest fruit in the tree. But I want to end with stories from our own part of the world, here in Southeast Asia. So now we're going to turn to the Panchatantra, wonderful co collection of stories from India, and their version of the smart little rabbit that outsmarts a very large and ferocious enemy. Once upon a time, there is a very hungry lion who hunts every day and kills the animals in large numbers. And they knew that soon there would be very few animals left. So they decided, okay, let's just get over it and offer one animal to this lion every day if he will agree to just stay in his den and we'll bring him food every day. Well, the lion agreed. So from that day onward, one animal was chosen to be sent to the lion to be his meal. One day, it was the turn of a very small rabbit, but it was a very clever rabbit, and he did not want to be eaten. So on the chosen day, he slept late, and he arrived at the lion's den mid-afternoon. Now, this lion was not happy about this, very angry, and roared, I've waited all day for you, and now I get one puny little rabbit? What sort of a meal is this? But the rabbit, being a clever rabbit, said, oh, gosh, lion, we were six rabbits on our way here when this incredible, ferocious lion, obviously the new king of the forest, showed up and ate five of us. But I escaped because I knew I had to run here and tell you because he's going to come and kill you. Well, the lion becomes so furious at this story that he says, take me to this new lion's den. Right? So the rabbit agrees. He takes the lion, obviously, to a deep well, points in it and says, this is his fortress. Look, my lord. And when the lion goes to the well and looks inside, he sees his own uh, mirage, of course, and he jumps in and dies. And the rabbit goes back, and everybody's happy in the forest from then on. A similar version of this story is told all across Southeast Asia. Only the animals are substituted for local animals, but they usually retain the same characteristics. In Japan, as you saw, crocodiles, sometimes sharks. In Southeast Asia, the smart little animal sometimes is a rabbit, sometimes it's one of those little mouse deer. In the Malay version, in the Panchatantra, a mouse deer substitutes for the rabbit and a tiger substitutes for the evil animal. And Vietnam substitutes a cat for the rabbit. They all take on details of their own environments and their own cultures. And America has its own version in the southern states with the story of brother fox and um, brother rabbit or brer fox and brer rabbit, of course. Interestingly, some cultures give us a very different moral to the story. It gives us the lion or the tiger's perspective. Ending with the moral, never underestimate your opponent. If you have a chance, kill him off without thinking twice, or you may never have a second choice. Well, this is the moral I hope you don't take with you tonight, but let's all try to be that clever little rabbit outwitting the lions and tigers of our lives. And so with that, I wish you a happy Chinese New Year. The end. So now you all have stories to tell your children and grandchildren. <laughs> We have spanned across the globe in many continents, and we feel like Da Vinci Code. We should crack all these codes about <laughs> symbolic animals. Now, do we have any questions or comments from the audience? Please raise your hand. Yeah. 
Nothing. It's all. You're always welcome to come up and talk to me yes. at the end. <laughs> oh. Okay. Please come. Please wait for the microphone. Please, please. Okay. Uh, hello. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the different animals which you showed in the Chinese calendar or whatever you can say. Uh, which which uh, animal does fascinate you the most? Because you have studied mm -hmm. quite a few of them you were talking about. They're all interesting. The thing that I, I, it took me a long time before I realized is that those 12 animals are actually in pairs. So you'll have um, a, a, a weak one and a strong one, or a big one and a large one. So that the order that they come in is, I mean, the fairy tale is very cute about crossing the turbulent river and all that. But actually, the Chinese have paired them up very much. And this is to show not to be too extreme, but from, you go from one end, you go to another. It's, it's sort of reversal is the movement of the Tao. It's, it's a very Taoist thought, and it's reflected in the, in the Chinese zodiac. So you look at that list of 12 animals, and you see how the two animals go together, right? It's, it's the rat and the ox, right? It's, it's the clever rat, and it's, it's the big muscular but fairly dumb ox, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Hmm? Every two years, they're in pairs, two, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, which, which animal is paired with the rabbit? I do not know, really. Tiger. Uh, tiger. 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 Yeah, tiger. We just came from the year of the tiger. Yeah, tiger. Right? And rabbit. So there you have those two right there. Sorry, my head's already working on next year's, which is the dragon. <laughs> and then the snake, right? If you think yes. about it, if you really look at that list, you see how it works out. It took me a long time to realize that. Yes. And then I asked a very clever Chinese friend of mine, um, and she said, yes, yes. Her grandparents had told her that story, too. Okay. Thank you for my throat lozenge, and thank you to the CM Society for hosting me again. I always enjoy my talks here. You have many more, more talks to complete. You don't want to complete. Well, no, 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 no. Hey, please, please, please okay. ask, please ask. Please Sorry. Ask. Um, my question is, you said that there was a disappearance of the rabbit during the Yuan Dynasty, and then they made it a comeback to the Ming Dynasty. But then, because of the Yuan were the Mongols, so that's probably the reason why. But then when it shifted to Qing Dynasty, they were Manchu, but the rabbit didn't disappear. But I, I think I get you right on that point. Okay, so was it because the, the Xing really carries on a lot of things from the Ming, didn't really disregard them, whereas... No, the no, they, they completely, they, they changed the robes, they changed the festivals, they changed even the religious practices. The Qing really did a number on the Chinese Ming dynasty. Okay. And <laughs> No, um, they were still fairly subservient during, during the Song. It really wasn't until popular literature brought out all the folk tales that included stories about the rabbits and their characters that the rabbits sort of reappeared and became popular. Okay. I've and done a lot of searching through files um, the whole last year. My other question, okay, and my other yeah. question is that um, how did uh, animal heads get into your Sang Rolong collection? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've I've read the article of that you know that that somehow maybe two of them reappear in Yu Sang Rulong collection from Yuan Ming Yuan, but then I didn't know how it got from there to him. I, I'm so, I, I think I'm. Oh no no I. Yeah, yeah. Um, un undisclosed source. I did some research on this, and I even called the I even called the auction house, who basically hung up on me <laughs> when, when I asked the question and, and said that's a matter of confidential records. But he obviously bought them from someone. We know most of the animal heads were taken by either British or French, and they went back into estates. And we still haven't found two two or three of them are still missing. Yeah, yeah. I think someone else has given a, a talk about these these heads, right? Yeah. Any more questions? Any comments? You can look up um, the pair of zodiac animals because they are symbolic of, for example, brawn and brain, for example, or um, you know you have large serpent, a dragon, and a small serpent. One has 
very powerful, but small one can go everywhere, for example. <laughs> but, and it's similar to us today, yin yang, black, white. There are, there are duality in everything. That's why there are six pairs of animals. There's duality in everything. Think about it. So, um, without further ado, anyway, Happy New Year three times to all of you. I didn't get to introduce any speakers since the beginning of the year. And in Thailand, we tend to celebrate many New Years. First, the International New Year, Chinese New Year, and one coming up. We still, according to some Gran, we're still in the Year of the Tiger. So, 13th of April, it's Year of the Rabbit. So, Happy New Year, Happy New Year, Happy New Year. And thank you very much, Kun Patricia Wells, for this. Another fascinating and interesting talk. So we'll have to invite you to come for the next, to complete the whole zodiac cycle. Please come here. <laughs>